one of Europe's most powerful committees will vote on an issue as fundamental as life itself. Yet hardly anyone knows about it, and there has been no public debate. Tonight's dispatch reveals how large multinational companies are laying claim to the ownership of all new life forms. As they create new plants, drugs and animals through genetic engineering, they're attempting to patent each new invention. But should they be allowed to? Tonight's Dispatches investigates this crucial debate. Is science starting to outstrip the law? Can anyone have the right to a patent on life? It's no longer science fiction. New plants, new animals are already being created. New life forms that can be patented and owned by their inventors. You're going to hear people talking about Adolf Hitler and, and his genetic uh, experiments. Uh, you're going to hear all kinds of horror stories about what could or could not happen. Its supporters claim the biotech revolution will bring untold benefits. I think the impact is going to be immense. It will affect nearly every major industry that I can conceive of, that is the pharmaceutical and healthcare, agriculture, food, waste treatment, and the environment. I see cows producing uh, plastic substitutes. I see sheep producing pharmaceutical drugs. I see biomass replacing fossil fuels. And it doesn't stop there. According to those who see a rosy biotech future, oranges will grow in Britain and apples in the Sahara. Animals with antifreeze genes will graze in the polar regions on crops that do not even require soil. Critics do not doubt the power of the technology. We're moving out of the industrial age into the biotechnical age. This is as profound a shift uh, as the one we experienced between medieval agriculture in Europe and the advent of the Industrial Revolution. But they are less convinced that the future will have a rosy glow. The environmental consequences, the economic consequences, and the social and ethical consequences, they're all profound and disturbing. It's almost 40 years since Watson and Crick won the Nobel Prize for uncovering the structure of DNA the molecule that carries the genetic code found in every cell. By the late 70s, it had become possible to remove a gene from one organism and implant it in another. Genes that carry every characteristic of life and make elephants larger than mice, the hair faster than the tortoise, and humans more intelligent than plants could be taken from one life form, be it a bacteria, a plant, or a human being, and used in any other, creating mutations impossible in nature. By the mid-80s, the first commercial exploitation of genetically engineered life forms had begun, with the simplest forms of life, bacteria and viruses. You take genes, and you start injecting them into a bacteria. It may fall on that genome of the bacteria in just such a way as to create a new genetic mutation, which could be deadly. You won't know until somebody finally takes the substance and consumes it. So you're playing ecological roulette every time you insert genes from one organism into the bacteria of another. I felt as if someone had hit me all over my body with a blowtorch. It was, I was in the bathtub all the time in hot water. That was the only relief that any of us got early on. By this time, uh, it was just excruciating muscle pain everywhere throughout in the body. They just, there was no part of the body that was um, free of pain. Your skin just burns, it burns and burns, and, and I can't, I can't, I can't sleep with my husband because we can't sleep, I, he touches, you know, um, 
I just can't stand to be touched. It just hurts. Sandy, Margaret, and Bob believe they're the victims of the first genetically engineered disease, EMS. So far, it's killed 32 people. They all took L-tryptophan tablets for insomnia or depression. Sold in health food shops, it was marketed as natural. But L-tryptophan was manufactured by Shawa Denko, a Japanese company, using genetically altered bacteria. The company denies genetic engineering was to blame, but unless this is proven, Jeremy Rifkin believes control should be tightened and further applications stopped. We have petitioned the Food and Drug Administration in this country uh, uh, in the aftermath of the L-tryptophan tragedy, and we have requested that they uh, hold up any further commercial uh, application of any substance that's been made through recombinant DNA and genetic engineering process. A variety of genetically engineered drugs are available in Britain, but it seems to be one of Britain's biggest trade secrets that the first genetically engineered food in Europe has just gone on sale here. Marks and Spencers, Safeways and Sainsbury's are all selling cheese manufactured using genetic engineering. All of these companies refused to be interviewed and all said that they would not be labeling the new cheese. New genetically produced bacteria, plants and animals are on the way. But if a directive currently going through the European Parliament in Brussels is passed, they can be patented as well. Companies will own crops such as wheat and barley and animals such as cows and sheep, for patent rights will extend to all life forms, even humans. Clearly we want to see the directive changed. We have a big issue on our hands, which can be a disaster in a whole series of ways, economically, morally, ethically. What we now want is for people to realize that the, the, the problems we face are actually far more immense than they originally realized. So I don't want to criticize the people who produced the patent directive, but I would want to criticize them if they're not prepared to now recognize that they're actually bitten off far, far more than they're capable of coping with at the moment. Critics of the directive believe the current patenting legislation will hand power to the multinationals. The farmer who utilizes the patented plant and future generations will have to pay for the use of it. They'll have to pay what would be the equivalent of royalties to be able to actually use that plant. It seems to me we cannot leave it up to those groups who by definition are looking after their own interests rather than the interests of the community as a whole. Hardly a surprise, therefore, that industry is in favor of the patent directive. For industry, it's absolutely crucial it's crucial because in order for research and development to be commercialized, to find products in the marketplace, it's necessary to protect the inventions. And that's what the patent directive will do for Europe. Who are we to say that we have a right to have a property interest in life forms? I mean, this is not just uh, uh, that we're not talking about ownership of land. We're not talking about ownership of an airplane or an automobile. We're talking about owning uh, the genetic material that will, for years and years to come, reproduce itself through the laws of nature, and that we're going to allow an individual or a corporation to have a property interest in it. As far as the genetic engineering of crops is concerned, there are certainly enough corporations that are interested. I think everything that we consume today will be altered by genetic engineering. I think we'll be able to grow crops today that, that are not even, you know, that we haven't even seen. And I mean, for example, in the UK, I mean, you could almost stretch your imagination and say that someday you'd probably be able to grow coffee in the UK.
Like most giant food corporations, PepsiCo, who own, apart from the drink, Kentucky Fried Chicken and Walker's Crisps, is investing heavily in genetic engineering. By manipulating the genetic makeup of the potato, they're creating a new type of potato, which will allow them to make more crisps from each tuber. It's really not science fiction at any, anymore at all. Uh, these are very, very achievable, very easy. As I said, it's almost to the point now where you have the gene particularly, that it's almost cookbook to put it into a plant. You can even stretch your imagination and say that what you'd like to do is take some fish genes and put it in potatoes, and those things are possible today. The most important part is will consumers actually accept these products? This may be the thing that provides, you know, food for people and, and the higher yield and disease resistance and so forth. I don't think we can, we can ignore this technology. We may not be able to ignore it, but should we be able to patent its products? And are they safe? A worst case scenario would be that you put uh, a gene into a plant, um, let's say a potato, uh, to protect it against a virus infection. Yes, it provides um, disease resistance, but then it evolves and it evolves and evolves. And let's say it evolved into a toxin. And let's say that toxin was pathogenic for humans eating the potatoes. Even Clem Kula doesn't deny that there are risks. Now to say without a doubt there's no risk at all, I can't say that. I, I can't. I mean, I'm sure people went through this when they discovered electricity. <laughs> but you know, it, it's, it's just magnificent technology and, and we have to go with it. You can't inoculate a child against starvation, but you can inoculate the wheat. We don't actually stick a needle into each seed. That would be ridiculous. At ICI, we coat it, we feed it, and now can even breathe resistance into it. It seems like the perfect solution to an age-old problem. World problems. World solutions. World class. Making crops resistant to pests and disease is seen by its supporters as one of the great opportunities of genetic engineering. Scientists at Durham University were the first to isolate a gene that made crops resistant to a particular insect and were able to transfer it from one species to another. This technology has tremendous potential because what we're aiming to do is to produce plants with inherent increased resistance to pests and thereby enabling us to drastically reduce the levels of chemical pesticides that need to be applied to protect them. It sounds ideal, but the consequences of developing a super strain could bring unexpected problems. Well, let us say that some form of hiccup occurred which had not been detected in the laboratory, and the genetic source proved ineffectual, or there was some form of predator or some form of disease which hit it and wiped out millions of acres which were required to feed vast and huge numbers of people across the world. And one doesn't have to rely on disaster scenarios to see that there are risks. Pest-resistant genes work by producing a poison that kills the insects that feed on the plant. It's possible that the gene will transfer to another species, perhaps making the weeds also resistant to insects. Of course there are risks, and this is why we have to look at possible escape, if you like, of this gene into wild, weedy species. And these are, are problems that we have to consider. We can't just sweep them under the carpet. That's not quite how they see it at ICI. Generally speaking, in our particular area, I think the risks are all either very low or zero. Plant breeders have been producing plants uh, for hundreds of years, well, certainly for a hundred years, uh, without any apparent risk to the environment. Um, and to think that because we change one gene in a plant which contains some 30,000 genes, that's going to make that plant automatically dangerous in some way, uh, seems to me uh, a somewhat ludicrous proposition. 
not so ludicrous, however, according to Hiltrud Breyer, who's leading the fight in the European Parliament against the painting directive. The risk is very, very large, and I think this first accident, the El Tryptophan cases, shows how large it can be, and it's just the beginning. It can um, increase tremendous damage to all people, but we have never had a debate about the risk. Like PepsiCo, ICI are investing heavily in the genetic engineering of crops. Seven years ago, they weren't involved in plant breeding at all. Now, through the acquisition of five companies, they are the fifth largest in the world and have applied for between 50 and 100 patents. They're currently working on crops such as wheat, barley, maize and sugar beet. Most advanced is their work on the tomato that doesn't go soft. According to Keith Pike, patents are vital. Without patent protection, uh, research and development in all areas of science and technology would dry up because nobody's going to pump large sums of money over long time periods into producing things which are new and of value. If as soon as they put them on the market, they can be hijacked and copied by anybody. But could patents lead to a small number of companies owning the world's crops? It is on the cards. Um, where you can buy up the stock which is required for alteration and then patenting, where you can do this and where you can then claim ownership, you can also attract obviously enormous profits. These fears are not altogether without foundation. Of the plant-related patent applications to the European Patent Office up until 1990, three quarters originate from multinational companies or biotech companies in their control. And of these, nearly a half are taken up by just three giant corporations, Lubrizol, Monsanto and Sibagaygi. The introduction of new genetically engineered crops may have its dangers. But in the United States, patent rights are no longer restricted to plants. If a company develops and patents a, a form of genetic material that can be used to create a super cow or a super pig, for example, and they don't let anybody else have access to that ge genetic material. The laws of economics will soon give them the whole marketplace. And I'm not sure that's good for the country. It's certainly not good for the farmers who don't have access to that genetic material. But I think we're, we're moving down a path that, that, uh, uh, that would be wrong to, to do. The threat that a few giant companies might come to dominate and concern over the growing queue of animal patents led Congressman Rose to introduce a bill to halt the patenting of life. It failed. Uh, the, the chairman of the committee that was supposed to consider my bill has been defeated and his, uh, his top staff person is now an official with the genetic manipulation company. So I, I, uh, we never had the full and fair public debate on the subject. In Europe, it had been assumed that until the EC directive became law, no animal patents would be granted. But then, just as the bill was going through the committee stage in the European Parliament, the European Patent Office announced its intention to grant a patent on a mouse, invented at Harvard, but controlled by the DuPont Corporation. The watershed that we've reached in Europe with the, the Harvard mouse patent judgment is that an invention shall not be deemed to be unpatentable simply by virtue of the fact that it involves living matter. So an invention that involves living matter is now to be judged on exactly the same grounds as an invention involving bricks and mortar or physics or chemistry. I mean, if you actually allow someone to patent a partic particular animal that is actually far more effective, far more efficient in terms of producing whatever, milk, meat, they are inevitably going to drive the competition off the market. You can then make monopoly profits. Not surprising, therefore, that a whole range of animal patents on cows and chickens, sheep and pigs are pending. Security at the companies engaged in this research is serious. 
Not only is there the question of a valuable industrial secret, but there's the danger of escape. Most work is still being carried out inside, in laboratory conditions. But in Auburn, Alabama, they've taken an important step towards commercial production with external enclosures. They have patents pending on their latest invention, catfish and carp that are two-thirds bigger than their normal counterparts. The fish on the left is a normal catfish, whilst that on the right contains a growth hormone gene from the rainbow trout. Initially, the team put a human growth gene into the fish, but have now abandoned this because of the dangers involved. Some people may feel that uh, the fact that this fish has a human gene, am I consuming a, a, a human? Uh, there's a, a possibility that a fish producing human growth hormone, uh, once that's consumed, uh, even though the, the flesh is cooked, that there's a possibility that uh, uh, whole human growth hormone could uh, uh, enter the bloodstream and, and actually uh, be biologically active within the, uh, uh, within the human consuming that fish. But it's not just the hazards of eating genetically engineered fish that worries critics. Genetically engineered organisms are alive. So because they're alive, they can reproduce, mutate, migrate, and you can't recall them. Genetically engineered organisms pose a different set of environmental risks than chemical or even nuclear products. Now, obviously, when you introduce one of these organisms into the environment, there's only a small chance that it's going to do harm. Uh, but if it does do harm, the long-term disruption to an ecosystem can be profound. The Auburn team are not unaware of the potential hazards of the fish escaping. Barbed wire fencing surrounds the area. Bird netting covers the ponds. A series of complex filters prevent drainage or flood water carrying the fish away. And a lake containing hungry predators awaits any hapless escapees. There are some people that feel that uh, if these fish uh, were to escape uh, and survive, uh, that uh, they would be uh, aggressive, uh, increase their size, increase their numbers, and decrease the numbers of some native species that are considered more desirable. That is a, uh, a possible scenario, but a very unlikely one. But even if one is prepared to take the risk of release into the environment, some scientists in the field are far from confident about the accuracy of the technique. The technology to introduce genes into animals is a, a little bit like a blunderbuss being shot by a blindfolded person towards a target. Something will get there, maybe one copy, maybe many copies, somewhere not precisely where one would like it to go. You may change the character of the animal, for instance, uh, predispose it to a cancer situation or to a deformity of development that it would not normally have. And some of the first genetic experiments have already gone badly wrong. At the US Department of Agriculture, a pig was given a human growth gene to make it grow bigger but died blind, arthritic, and unable to walk. In Australia, sheep were injected with a hormone produced by genetic engineering so they would shed their fleeces without the need for shearing. The total loss of protective hair led to severe sunburn. There's no real chance of um, I don't know, cows being developed without any legs or something like that, is there? I mean, it would seem pretty yep. absurd, wouldn't it? Um, one would imagine that it would be a, a senseless thing to do. But on the other hand, if a cow with no legs might produce 12 gallons of milk instead of 10, because she didn't have to use her legs to stand up on and thereby required less energy, maybe someone would think that we ought to do it. Do you think that's possible? Oh yes, it's possible. What sort of animal is out of bounds, as it were? Suppose you had a cow that was twice as big as that. Okay. 
I, I think that's almost impossible again for me to comment on um, bioethic councils trying to look at these problems ought to try and come to some sort of guidelines for industry. Well, that sounds like, well, what should happen is there should be a debate, but we don't really have any view on it. You're, you're asking about limits to... To what research could be done or should be done. I, I think that's just, again, a very difficult question for me to answer because there's so many different... I mean, it's just such a complicated subject. There are all sorts of things that could be done or couldn't be done. Um, you know, how long is a piece of string? Let me make it easier, perhaps. I've come down to saying, well, you know, should I do this or should I do that? You know, should we have a cow with five toes? Or should we have a car with two hearts? Do you know what I mean? You can start philosophising. At the end of the day, industry can't work to that. I can't see where it will ever stop. I can't see where we'll ever be able to draw the line and say, no, no further. Because I think that line has to be drawn here and now with genetic engineering. But drawing the line is a difficult business. Transgenic animals already provide a cheap, efficient source of drugs. These goats, for example, are 0.00002% human being. A human gene has been inserted into their genetic makeup, so they secrete a human protein in their milk, which can be extracted and given to cardiac patients to prevent blood clots. Similar techniques in sheep are producing factor IX, the blood protein which haemophiliacs lack, and a host of other drugs from transgenic animals are on the way. So just where is the line to be drawn? It's all very well being philosophical about it. The truth of the matter is people would rather be alive than dead. And when they come along to the hospital and say, help me, doctor, at what stage are you going to draw the line? Dr. White has been working on a project since 1984 that could revolutionise surgery by transplanting pig's organs into people. What we're trying to achieve is to produce by genetic engineering techniques an animal, and the animal species that we favour is the pig, that would act as a universal donor for man. Most of the organs I think we can transplant using this technology with, within five to ten years. Are people going to accept the notion that they're walking around with a pig's heart. Undoubtedly, there will be a lot of emotional reaction to what we are hoping in the long term to do. But after all, we already transplant uh, pig heart valves into human beings. What's the difference between the heart valve and the whole, whole heart? People might not accept using pig skin for saving people who've had serious burns. But then why will they accept, uh, for instance, I see you've got leather on your feet. What's the difference between using skin to make shoes and using skin to save people's burns? I would actually suggest that the therapeutic use of pig tissue is less unacceptable than the use of pig tissue for frying as bacon for breakfast. Although Dr. White has not yet developed pigs for human transplants, he has applied for a patent on any animal which contains the immune response gene that enables its organs to be transplanted to humans and avoid rejection. If you're going to spend £200 million worth of your money on a project, the last thing you want to see is the guy down the road saying, what a good idea to breed these pigs, and essentially getting in on the back of all your work and all your expenses for nothing. And that, in essence, is the point of a patent, whether it happens to be an animal or a new traffic light. Of course I'm always in favour to help people to uh, that they get relief from their sickness, but the point is they always make promises, 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 and they never have a product or a cure to help these people. After a while they will think about to create better human beings. Maybe they will have genes to have blonde hair or uh, black hair and so on. And this goes in a very, very uh, eugenic way. There are certainly personal limits 
that each one of us would not want to overstep. I think it, it comes down to the general consensus of the population as to what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, and by and large the general public are fairly sensible on what uh, uh, is uh, an acceptable uh, limit of, of decent behaviour. And I hope we try and stay well within those limits. I think the patenting of genes, transgenic animals, has become inevitable, whether one likes it or whether one doesn't like it. But I do ask the question, where does it stop? Will it stop with humans? And it could be that the first steps in that direction have already been taken. The painting of life, whether in the form of bacteria, plants or animals, may be questionable. But perhaps the most bizarre development has been the US application to patent hundreds of human genes by the team involved in the Human Genome Project, an international venture to map human DNA, with the prospect of thousands of patents to come. David White's defense of the principle of patenting human genes may seem reasonable enough. The principle of patenting a human gene should have exactly the same rules applied to it as patenting anything else. Is it novel? Is it not obvious? Is it useful? And if those three rules apply, then it should be patentable irrespective of whether it's a piece of DNA or a new form of butter. But when it comes to the American patent application, this is not a view that is supported by the head of the British team working on the Human Genome Project. There's a very fundamental view which I hold quite strongly, and that is that the, the genes as 100,000 elements in our genetic makeup are, are part of our common inheritance. And I actually find morally repellent the idea that somebody is systematically taking out commercial coverage of, of these things. Suppose somebody had patent on the whole of human DNA. I mean, what sort of purpose could they put it to? Anybody who had intellectual property rights over the, the basic material, the basic information within that system would effectively be able to hold everybody else to ransom. You know, there's the commercial exploitation of new therapies or whatever would be dictated by somebody who would be in a monopoly position. I don't think that can ever be a good thing. But you don't have to employ a moral or ethical argument to realize that the ownership or control of human genetic information has social consequences that need more than a second thought. Gene mapping and its ultimate uh, consequence, uh, gene screening, uh, could be used as the most powerful tool of social discrimination ever devised. For example, should a corporate employer in a white collar field know if you have a genetic predisposition for Alzheimer? You may not get Alzheimer, but they might not want to spend 10 years training you for a high level corporate position if their investment is going to be short changed when you're 45 and get Alzheimer. Should your insurance company know if you have a genetic predisposition for alcoholism when you're trying to get auto insurance? You may never become an alcoholic, but it may be that the insurance company will deny you access or increase your premium simply because it's in your genes. What I'm suggesting is this, genetic, the Genome Project, genetic screening is going to create a new form of discrimination. In the United States, we had a civil rights movement in the 1960s. In the 1980s, uh, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, we had a human rights movement. In the 1990s, we're going to see a genetic rights movement. Last July, such arguments convinced Nobel scientist James Watson, who discovered DNA, to back a genetic privacy bill in the US Congress. I think, you know, the genetic information should be totally confidential and it shouldn't be available to anyone. I mean, I think uh, the thought of a giant database with everyone's predispositions, I think, is repulsive. The genetic privacy bill is expected to become law next year, but in Europe, there are no regulations to cover disclosure of genetic information. What's more, a preliminary screening for genetic disease took place in London last year, and later this year, the first widespread screening for genetic disease is planned for the UK.
Whether we like it or not, a revolution is coming. New life forms will change our world and the way we make it. But as the vote in the European Parliament draws closer, the real issue is not can we stop the revolution happening, for it will happen, but can we regulate it to contain its power and limit its danger? We actually need to have some controls over the social implications and the economic and financial implications in terms of control over food production and food processing throughout the European community and worldwide. It's a scandal that uh, the public is kept out of the discussion and it is a decision which is uh, merely done by the lobbyists. They have a big, big influence on the European Commission and we must reject this uh, patenting uh, directive and ask for a public uh, debate on this um, patenting directive. Even Philip Paxman, an ardent advocate of genetic engineering, a partner in a biotech company, recognises the need for regulation. There's been an explosion of knowledge and it's galloping away um, ahead of the educational system, indeed ahead of the regulatory system and ahead of the legal system. What is happening in our laboratories has outpaced the framework of society in which it's happening. I think most biotech com companies would vastly prefer there'd be no discussion about this at all and let them quietly work out uh, a system that is best for them economically. PepsiCo, whose genetically engineered products will go on sale in two years, certainly don't seem to welcome regulation and the labelling of genetically engineered products with open arms. I think it's a bad idea. I mean, you know, I think if you look back at the history of things, when you look at the history and you t see things that are regulated, Generally, it doesn't work very well. And even if we do regulate, can we do so effectively? One clearly can't legislate against a, a, a monster. And uh, if you go back into the earlier years of this century, where well-intentioned geneticists uh, like Galton um, were concerned with eugenics, the idea of improving the human race by genetic means. I mean, their benevolent and rather woolly-minded uh, approach uh, took some rather alarming twists thereafter. And one hope. Oh. What do you mean? My, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, Germany in the 30s and 40s, which is in a sense a large-scale exercise in uh, in genetic manipulation. And one hopes that that isn't going to happen again, but uh, I think you'd be taking a very sanguine view of human nature if you ruled out the possibility. I don't think we have a right to willy-nilly change the genetic blueprint after millions of years of evolution. I don't think we have the right to play God. I don't think we have the right to take genetic destiny in our own hand. I don't think we have the wisdom to direct it. I don't think we have the clairvoyance uh, to intervene. And I don't think anyone ought to have that kind of power over the blueprint of life. Even executives at ICI have their doubts. People have to use their common sense, their judgment, uh, both in the plant breeding companies and in the regulatory bodies, um, and to put in such systems, fail-safe systems as you can. But at the end of the day, it's all relying on human beings, and they're the riskiest people of all.